time while our children are dismissed. While they're dismissed, we want to thank each and every one for praying for wisdom last week. Um, we were able to get everything done and uh, unpack some a few crates until we found them. We had to cut the bolts on all three of them. And, uh, but they should be getting, my parents should be getting their crates by the first of next week. So it was a long day. And um, unfortunately, it was, or fortunately, it wasn't snowing or raining, just a wet ground. But we were able to get in there and get down there and uh, procure everything on the third try. Amen. Let's take our Bibles. Let's go to John chapter 3 and verse 16. John chapter 3 and verse 16. Being Christmas, your mind is always thinking about the greatest gift given to mankind. And I mentioned Wednesday night, I was driving down the road, and um, there was a bumper sticker proclaiming that this person was the greatest gift ever given. And after looking at the car and looking at the person, I don't know if I want to be in the same household as that person because she didn't look like a gift to anybody. She looked like she'd be a tiger. Um, anyway, it hit me as I read this bumper sticker, somebody think pretty highly of themselves that they're the greatest gift of persons. And I thought, yet we forget about the greatest gift given to mankind. And that was Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world, the Bible says in John 3, 16, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That He gave. The giver was not Christ. The giver was God, who gave His only begotten Son. And I thought about this. The purpose of Christmas was the giver loved us so much that He saw that we had no hope in ourselves to ever get to heaven. And He gave His Son as the gift to you and I. The problem is that gift in billions of lives is still left unopened. The Bible says in John chapter 4 and verse 10, And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. I love it. If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, who was sitting in front of that woman of the well, none other than the greatest gift to mankind, Jesus Christ. And he said, if you knew who the gift of God was, you wouldn't be asking of me. <laughs> You'd be asking of me, not who are you, but give me that water. I want that eternal life. I want that water. But Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through who? Jesus Christ our Lord. So my question that the Lord gave me as I read that bumper sticker what will our gift be to God this year? What will our gift? God's given us His gift. Are we the greatest gift ever given, according to this bumper sticker? Are we that gift that everybody just falls over and goes, oh, you're so perfect? If people try telling you that, they're probably lying to you. But you think about this, people have a false sense of who they think they are. But if people were really honest, let's imagine everybody in the world was honest and told you what they really thought all the time. How many of us would really wonder if we're really liked at all? You know, you think about this. 
Everybody, how are you doing today? I'm fine. Let's all raise our hand. No, just kidding. How many are really fine when you say that? How many of you are really having a bad day? You're in an ill mood. Something's not going right, and we go, we're fine. I'm guilty. I say that quite a bit sometimes, and I'm not fine. I'm struggling with my depression. I'm struggling with things. I'm just not in the people mood because of my health. You think about God. He knew we are not fine. He knew the wages of sin is death. And he says, I want to give you the greatest gift you'll ever need. A gift that you'll never need another gift in your life. And so he asks us, what will we give him? What's our gift back to him who's given us anything and everything we ever need? I could ask for a show of hands today. How many has been blessed this year? We've all been blessed. Greater than we can ever imagine. I, I was looking back at some things God's given and done for my family this year, and I'm, I'm standing and amazed. I was just looking at, just this last week, my wife says, oh, this screen popped up on the copier, and it says that. So it's like, okay, no problem. So I called the copier repairman. We got a service contract with him. I said, this is what the screen's saying. He goes, okay. He goes, uh, first of all, Konica no longer makes parts for this. Okay. Second of all, if we could get them, they're coming from Japan. <laughs> and he goes, but we've been wanting to get you into a new one for that one you bought in the first part of 2010. I said, yep. But I thought, you know what, God? You're in control. You have last, you know what he told me last time he came here to service? This was the biggest piece of junk Minolta Konica ever made. And he says, how yours lasted 11 years, I have no earthly idea. He said, they quit making this model after three years. He says, and yours is the Energizer Bunny. It just keeps going and going. Who did that? Me? No. He says, I, you're the only Konica still standing in all of Canada. He says, and we're still offering a service program on it. And he goes, one day we're going to get you out of this thing. I said, when it dies. So you know what he said? It's dead. <laughs> We've dealt with him for almost 17 years. But you know, you think about this. Who did that? That's a blessing from God. To, to buy, unbeknownst to me, it was brand new. First year model. Became the biggest lemon they ever made. And yet God made that thing last 11 years. We bought it in January 2010. So 22 will be almost 12 years. That thing's been printing. God's good. How many of us, I was driving to Toronto and I saw two cars on the side of the road with a flat tire. Thank the Lord, I've never had a flat tire on the 401, the worst place I could ever imagine it. I've never had an accident on the 401. Think about all that God's done for us in little gifts on top of the big gift. And sometimes we forget about the little things God does for us. Of the everyday little blessings in life. If anything, have you ever received a gift that far exceeded what you could have expected? Something so nice that just saying thank you seems so inadequate. Sometimes people do stuff for us and even myself. I feel so cheesy in saying just thank you. Because I know what they did was a sacrifice and saying thank you would just seem so empty. And I just want to do something back to them. But it's a gift. And if I go back and say, well, I got to get them a gift. And then they say, well, no, I got to give you a gift. And they go back and forth, back and forth. 
It's not really a gift. But how do you say thank you to something so magnificent as eternal life? How do you say thank you for someone that died for you and I? I read a story this week. Really touched my heart. In Ravensbrook, in 1945, toward the end of the war, the SS issued the orders to start liquidating people. And this elderly lady, as they were in line to be marched into the gas chamber, this elderly lady, Jewish lady, saw a young 13 year old young lady clinging to her mom and she begged the guard to remove her from the line and she says she's a Jew she doesn't deserve to live but this lady was extremely wealthy and she had carried in her person the entire time a small key. How it was not discovered, they do not know. But she went to the SS guard and said, if you spare this girl's life, I will give you all of my possessions. And they gave that key and it was to a safety deposit box in Berlin. That young girl ended up living. And she ended up being one of the top doctors in Israel with neurosurgeon. But that lady gave her fortunes to that evil person in sparing this young lady. And she became a neurosurgeon. Think about this. She says, I don't need the gift anymore. I don't need this anymore. Unfortunately, that young lady was able to tell the story, but that person ended up being killed by the allies and never got to spend. And what they found in that box was over $20 million in bonds. That lady was an extremely wealthy daughter of a diamond dealer in Germany. And she was willing to give $20 million for the life of that young lady. You know what the family did? What was left? They gave a portion of that to put that young lady through all of the best schools so that she could become the neurosurgeon. They honored their grandmother's wishes. You know, you know what the young lady said? I don't know how to even think. She saved my life. She goes, words, so my job is 24-7 is to save everybody I can with every scalpel cut I make. I do it in memory of her. You know, I read that, I'm like, wow. Wow. Man, it's, you hear in more and more stories of hero, heroism, of people, of what they've did now that we're coming on 80 years. And I think, willing to give up everything. And I think about us in our life. What are we willing to give? If anything, we feel inadequate to say, thank you, Lord for the greatest gift. God's greatest gift to you was His Son and salvation through Him. We feel like we want to do something special for that person to show our appreciation, but how can we say thank you to God this morning? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we open the Word of God and as we preach this morning, Use the words that you've allowed me to pin on paper that I may speak it with sincerity, love, and truth. 
But as the greatest question is asked, may we be able to answer it about our eternal destiny. Thank you, Lord, for allowing me to see that bumper sticker. Placing that thought upon my mind that I may challenge the people you've given me to shepherd. Use this, I pray, to grow us closer to you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. In the same way, when we consider all that Christ did for us on the cross and what he continues to do for us today, I feel so inadequate to simply tell him, thank you. He has given me, he has given you the greatest gift we could ever imagine eternal life. When I didn't deserve it, in the least. And if you look back at the last year, I'm sure you could find countless things He has done in your life that has just been icing on the cake. In fact, it's hard not to say, wow, God is great. How can I thank Him for everything He's done for me? What can I possibly do to show my appreciation to Him this Christmas? great question. Fortunately, the scriptures is filled with good blueprints for ways that we can show our thanks to God. This is our blueprint for all matters of faith and practice. And the great thing about it is when you ask, the Bible says, you shall find. So how can we say thank you in what ways can we say thank you to the God of heaven that gave us everything? As we search scriptures, we'll take some notes of some very important ways we are instructed. Ways people gave back to him and everything in scripture, everything in scripture is there as an example for us to live by. What is the best and greatest thing you can give God this year? If you have not, why not? If you are pretending and deceiving and believing you have listened to the scriptures clearly today, listen to this today. The number one thing that you can give God, and really it's the only thing that really matters, is our heart. What will your gift be to God? What He wants is our heart. Romans chapter 10 and verse 1 it says brethren my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. The greatest thing that he wants and the reason that we have Christ in Christmas is that he came to die for the world. That we through him might have eternal life. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 12 take heed brethren lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Our heart will either accept Christ or reject Christ. Our heart will either turn us to Christ or turn us from Christ. The heart is the matter of our lives. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It is the heart that determines whether we reject him or whether we accept him. The gift is there. But our heart has to want that gift. Many people will accept gifts. Many people, the devil will send false gifts and they'll believe that they have salvation. You've heard it from Brother Nye. You've heard it from myself. You've heard it from other preachers. The two things the devil loves to do the most is convince the lost that they're saved and convince the saved that they're lost. Because if you're going around doubting your salvation all the time, you're going to be useless. But if you're going around convincing yourself you're saved and not by the means Jesus Christ came to save you. I hear a lot of stories over the last 17 years of being a pastor of how people accepted Christ. 
Some are pretty interesting. But God says this. But what saith it? Romans chapter 10 verse 8. The Bible says, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee. Even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It begins with God's word, it ends with God's word. Can God use supernatural experiences? Yes, he can. But does he? Sometimes. But there are a lot of people that base their salvation on supernatural experiences. The Bible says here, what saith it? It is nigh. I've had people in this church tell me, yep, I got saved. When? My mom said I got saved when I was two. Or when I got saved when I was three. You mean your mom had to tell you you were saved? You're probably not saved. I don't remember. You know, the only thing around three years old I remember is my dad and older brothers went out hunting. And they had an old Fiat wagon. Those are older, know exactly what I'm talking about. And they brought this big old buck home from northern Grangeville, Idaho. And his eyes were still open and it was sitting up with his head up on the back seat. And they drove into the garage and there's this deer with this rack looking at me with his tongue. And it scared the living daylights out of me. All I saw was this deer, and I'm on my little, everybody remember those tricycles with the big round balls on the front and the side, you know, they were neat little things, plastic. And I'm sitting there driving that around, and I'll see that deer, and it's like, ah. that's all I remember. That's the only thing around three years old I remember. So you're going to tell me that I'm going to make an internal decision of right and wrong, and most of us don't even remember our second and third year in life. Be careful. That is an eternal decision that is necessary. We understand the word repentance. Our children will ask us. My kids ask me from the time that they could talk. Well, how about this? Not yet. Not now. You need to get a little bit older. The Bible talks about an age of accountability. As much as I want your children and my children to be saved, don't rush it. Because it could be a decision they'll base all their life on, well, I got saved when I was three. And they'll be under message after message after message after message and be convicted of it. But they'll go back, I was saved when I was three. And never have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It is with the mouth. It's not with your mouth. It's not with the parent's mouth. It's not with the grandparent's mouth. It's with my mouth confession is made. And this is why it's so, so important as parents to train up our child in the ways it should go. So when they get older, they're not going to depart from the faith. They're going to know Jesus Christ. And I mean depart from their salvation. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4 verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's only through Jesus Christ. But man, I see so many religions out there that says, yeah, but, and this. Yeah, but, and this. No, no, there's no yeah, but, and this. It's only through the name of Jesus Christ. It's nothing I can do. If I could work for my salvation, or if I can dream it, or if I can believe it off someone else telling me, then it's probably too good to be true. And this is why it's important that the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Once God begins to work in our heart, it's loving God with all our heart. There are going to be many people that miss heaven by 18 inches. They have a head knowledge, but they don't have a heart knowledge. I've always said they have a profession, but they're not a possession. Many people profess Christ, but they never possessed Him. Sadly, I've seen people 
the saddest thing as a pastor when the altar calls given or a message is preached, I can see people in their look and it just tears me up when I see those people cannot wait to get out of church instead of dealing with a conviction. I've seen people during the altar call of evangelistic meetings that they'll be gripping to the back of their pew until their knuckles are white because they don't want to move and follow God's leading because they've convinced everybody that they've been a Christian for all these years. And I'm thinking, if we're a true believer, am I going to get mad and say, well, I thought you've been saved all these years, or am I going to rejoice? What do you think? As a believer, if I know you, the devil has lost the grasp on you and you finally come to the realization and answer the conviction of the Holy Spirit and say, come forward and say, hey, pastor, my belief was in something else. I'd never put my personal trust and faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to be dancing around this building here a little bit because that's one more not going to hell. But see, the devil will say, well, if you go out there and you convince, what are people going to say? If they're not of Christ, they're going to be critical. But they're of Christ, they're going to be rejoicing. And this is where the devil's convinced people to sit still. Psalms 13, verse 5, But I have trusted in thy mercy, my heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. If it is a true salvation, I'm going to rejoice when someone comes forward, no matter the age. Years ago, my wife and I were at Crossroads Baptist Church, and there was a lady in church that had been in church all her life. Christian family, Christian grandparents, made a profession when she was a child, but no possession. When all her life became a teacher, taught Sunday school for years and years and years, was a deacon's wife, was all this, and then during this evangelistic meeting, she was fully convicted of her salvation and she won over the pride and you know what held her back when she walked forward? And she is in her late 50s now. She walked forward and bowed her head and the preacher gave the gospel plan of salvation to her and she accepted. She got up with tears streaming her ideas. She goes, I've been convicted before, but my pride said, what will my peers think? She goes, as of today, I didn't care. You know what the church did? Rejoiced. They were so happy. But you know what? Some of us may never get that chance to get that point again. We think about the greatest gift we could give Jesus Christ is our heart. Not just our lips, but our heart. With our heart, confession is made. Because there is no greater gift than we can give Christ is our heart and salvation this year. None. We have so many religious people but if God has our heart, guess what the second gift will automatically be? Our life. Upon giving Christ our heart, our life will be next. Really, what can I do with my life? Say train wreck? <laughs> I'm good at messing my life up. I really am. I know how to take a potter's wheel and make a beautiful vase. Are you kidding? I wouldn't make a lump of clay. I'm not a potter. But I'm like, move over, Lord. <laughs> Let me have my life. How many of us as parents came back from show and tell, and our kids brought us a beautiful vase? It won't hold nothing. It's the ugliest thing you've ever seen, but we're parents. That is beautiful, darling. I love your creativity. It's so creative. But really, it's parents' love. The Lord loves us, even when we try to make that perfect vase. In our eyes, it looks pretty good, and we're pretty proud of it. But in God's eyes, thank you. But let me make your life a more beautiful vessel. You know what the Bible says? A vessel fit for the master's use. Useful. I can never make my life useful, amen? And God wants more. What more can we give to God? Are we really, let's answer a question in our mind. Are we really giving all we can give to God? God did not stop short 
in giving his son, did he? Do you think God could have sent angels? He knew his son was suffering. Can you imagine God the Father looking from heaven's portal as his son was beaten beyond recognition? Can you imagine the Father as he looked upon a son as he hung on that cross with steel nails pierced through his wrist and feet? As they pounded the crown of thorns upon his son's head? How would you feel, fathers? I'd want to take vengeance as mine. But his father had a purpose. And what did he tell the woman at the well? And the disciples, my meat is to do my father's will. As he prayed at the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, not my will, but thine, O Lord. We ought to pray, not my life, but thine. You know what the Bible says? It is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, we are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. This vessel, such as it is, is my Father's. Upon giving Christ your heart, God's got everything, right? Most people think, He's got my heart. That's all He needs. No, no. If your employer just got your body, <laughs> what would he have? Takes your mind, takes your hand. He can have, I'm here for work. You going to get busy today? No, you got my body. I'm here. You're useless. You're not pulling the handles on a machine like I used to do. You're not starting the fire truck. You're not doing this. Now. I was like, so I showed up for the bell. So I got my clothes on. I'm ready. The fire's out there. <laughs> you got to get in the truck and go. You got to give your body. You got to give your life. And that's what we trained ourselves not to think about the dangers we were running into, but think about the lives that we were to save. It takes a great adrenaline and it takes overcoming great fear when you see in a house fully engulfed in flame and you're breaking down the front door and going in. You hear cracking and popping. You hear gas lines hissing. You hear everything. And you're walking in there checking every door for every person. And every little critter. And you come back out. And there's many times I've come back out and I'm just shaking. The adrenaline's worn off. You realize I'm out safe. Then you think about your family. What if that? What if this? But when you're doing it, you're giving your life for others. And you don't even think about it. Because your heart's in it. They obviously say if your heart's not in it, it's time to get out because you're going to make a mistake. That's anything. If our heart's not in it, what we're doing, we're not going to give it our best. But if our heart's in it, we're going to give our life. We're going to give our all. Isaiah is a great example to say, here am I. Send me, Lord. He knew that he was unworthy. He knew. And what happened to Isaiah? He knew that he was getting into trouble because God himself told him that he would be beaten. He would be rejected. And sure enough, historians say Isaiah was put in a hollow log and sawn in sunder. It's no name reference, but you'll notice the same phrase is in the book of Hall of Faith, Hebrews 11. And some were sawn asunder. Isaiah gave his life to preach the truth of the gospel. But he had to be willing to say, here am I, Lord. Send me. Samuel, as a young lad, his parents gave him to the service of the Lord. And as a young lad, he says, here I am. Samuel says, not me, call, or Eli says, not me calling you. Samuel says, but he said, go back to bed. It's God calling you. And he was the last prophet of Israel as a theocracy before it became a monarchy. 
1 Corinthians chapter 7, 23, You are bought with a price, but not ye the servants of men. But not ye. We're not the servants of men. Men did not buy us. Christ did. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, this is the greatest verse that we can claim. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's the least we can do this Christmas is to give our heart in salvation and to give our life in service. Time is short. I do not know when you and I will be called home. I pray we all go together. I do not know when I'm going to get a call and say, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so is gone on to heaven. I don't know when the church will get a call and say, Pastor Horton's gone. We don't know. But what have I done today in giving my heart and my life for Jesus Christ? What are we leaving? What legacy in my life of service are we doing all? Are we as faithful as we should be? It is required that a steward be found faithful. Are we found faithful? We're going to have to measure it with God's law, not mine, not yours, but God's law. God's law of faithfulness. God's law of service. Is it a reasonable service? Is, is, is it acceptable unto God? Not me. You're not here to please me. Please don't. Please God. Is it acceptable to God? Now don't think, well, yeah, I think he'd be. If you have to think he's going to be happy, it's probably not. Would he be measuring God's word to your life, happy in what you're doing today? Thirdly, what about our family? Our family's important. You know what's so important about the family? They're in the next generation of our country. That's pretty sobering. They're the next generation for our country to see Jesus Christ. If we're not concerned about raising them right now with the world we live in, will they be able to stand up to peer pressure tomorrow? Will they be able to stand right and be faithful to God and His ministry in 2035 and 2045 and 2055 of the Lord tarries? Are we preparing them for the future? Think about this. No one ever thought in a million years. I've read enough history books. I've studied enough history about world history and world wars. No one ever thought after 1918 that there would be a second world war so shortly after. 1918, November 11th, the peace accord was signed in the Ardennes Forest. The war to end all wars were done. By the time of 19, February of 1938, countries started to fall. Politically, economically, and in the spring of 1939, they started falling by war. 1918, 1939. By the spring of 1940, the war had engulfed most of Europe. Who had ever thought? But guess what the historian said? The Christian historian. The church between 1918 and 1940 become very lax and materialistic. And Europe fell because they had no guidance. The generation got lax. We're out of a war. Let's enjoy our family. Let's not worry about this. And never in their wildest dreams did they think they would go into this. And over 60 million Europeans lost their life in battle and other ways. 60 million. Folks, I don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. But what a, if we look at our test today, 
if we look at what's going to happen, what's going to be for our next generation? Are we training our children to rely on the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we asking them and showing them like Abraham and Hannah did? Hannah are a couple of perfect stories of parents giving their children to the Lord as a gift and honoring a command from the Lord. Abraham, we know the story in Genesis chapter 22, he finally has his teenage to adult son. He's enjoying the child of his old age. The promise of God that through him, his nation will be as the sand of the seas and the stars of the sky. And then God tempted him and says, I want you to offer him to me. Your only begotten son. Same verbiage as John 3.16. Abraham did not question Although I guarantee you as a parent, he ate. Can you imagine your own son saying, Father, where is the sacrifice? And you turn to your child and says, God will provide. As they marched on, the story goes that Isaac allowed himself to be bound and placed on the altar. But you know, the greatest part of that story is God made a way. But what if Abraham have not taught his son obedience? What if Abraham not taught his things, son the things of God? How would it turned out? A hundred year old plus man trying to tie up a teenager? Good luck on that one. But he taught to respect and fear God. Hannah giving a son of five years to the service of God. Was that hard on? That was the child she'd been praying for. She'd been barren. And she finally gets it. She promised God, I'm going to give him to you. Can you imagine as a five-year-old placing him at the temple of the door, bending down to make sure his coat's just right, giving him that last kiss on the cheek? And putting his hand inside Eli's and saying, by Samuel. At this point, she had no other kids. She gave her only son the promise of God to serve. How many of us would really be willing to give our families back to God? Fully back to God. Placing their hand in God's hand saying, God, here's my gift to you, my family. We need more dedicated families that serve God. From the time my kids grew up, they have traveled church after church, car seat after car seat. I've had to pull on the side of the roads and clean out blowouts and blowups and everything else and keep on going. I've had to preach and good thing pulpits are wide. I'm sitting there and they're introducing me as their guest preacher. And all of a sudden, I'm wearing a tan suit. My leg gets really warm. And Sabrina's got a look of smile on her face. You got to be kidding. So I tighten my joke up really quick and I get up to the pulpit real quick and I preach. And my leg has just been christened. <laughs> and not by a dog. But you know, the thing is, it's all about serving the Lord. I've taught my children that the greatest place they can be is in the house of the Lord. This is the only place they've known. This is their family. You are their adopted uncles and aunts. And I've taught them that. Because they have not been able to see a lot of their uncles. Some of my brothers they have not seen in 17 years. This has been their life you can look at their faces and tell that they've hated every moment of it. No. We never go, okay, kids, we got to go and work in the kitchen again this week. We got to go clean the church. We got to go. No. We're going to God's house. This is the greatest house of all. They have been here late nights, early mornings, and long days. When Lori and I were working in the church, back when we bought the building, 
they took care of the house. They cooked dinner. They cleaned the house while my wife and I were here for sometimes 12 hours a day. They lived. This is the ministry. This is what God's called us to do. It's how we as parents handle their lives. And training that giving to God is a pleasure. And we can never give too much to God. Are we ever going to be in debt to God? No. Our families, we got to teach them the importance of the house of God or they're going to lose it when they get older. If you don't teach them now, they won't be teachable later. You think about this. We need a strong next generation more than we have now. Because what's coming down the pike, any foretaste of what it is now, it's going to be harder than it is for us. Think about being a Christian, a true born again Christian. And I've read several books of pastors living in Germany trying to preach the truth. Most of them were sent to concentration camps never to return. Folks, I don't know what the future holds, but I'm so glad I know who holds the future. Fourthly, what about our possessions? The great thing we see that holds on to people is what about my future? God holds all that. What about my possession? God holds all that. Matthew 26, <laughs> three stories in the Bible that have always touched my heart of people giving to the Lord. Number one, the woman washing the feet of Jesus. Matthew 26 and verse 7, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box, a very precious ointment, and poured it on his head as he sat in meat. This ointment box was a gift from the mother and father to the virgin daughter. This was only to be given and broken on the head of her husband to show the sign that she has remained pure in her virginity and her trust till the day of marriage. It was priceless. Alabaster back then would cost the average parents a year to two years salary. This was priceless. And this lady that God saved came and broke it over the Lord Jesus Christ's head. You know what the other Christians said? By George, that could have been sold and fed the poor. They missed the point of giving. They missed the point that she wanted to anoint the head of Jesus for the greatest gift she'd given from him. Gotten from him, shall I say. She saved her. She was saved by him. And she was paying back with her most priceless priceless gift and the people around says that was a waste because God didn't have their heart and we know who said it Judas second one is the woman at the treasury Jesus leaning against the treasury wall the Pharisees are coming in going pulling out their wallet putting it in here comes the widow well all I have is Two tunies. Puts it in and walks off. It's all she had. She gave her life savings. The others were giving of their abundance, but she gave it all. You know what Jesus said? And there came a certain poor widow. She threw in two mites, which make it the farling. She gave all that she had. Not only is it mentioned in the book of Mark, but it's mentioned in the book of Luke that he saw a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. Both times he made mention that she was poor and a widow. She had no reliance on anyone. And we know at that time the Jews were not following their own practice of taking care of their fatherless and the widows. So she had no one to rely on, yet she gave it to the Lord. 
My favorite story in the New Testament as I would call as a young lad sitting on my dad's lap, the sick man story, the Samaritan. Here is a man that the world looked down on, despised because he was a half-breed. And yet Jesus Christ used him as an example of neighborly friendship and kindness. But a certain Samaritan as he journeyed came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds and poured in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed he took out two pits and gave them to the host and said unto him take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more when I come again I will repay thee. Take care of him and treat him the very best. And if that's not enough, when I come back through on business, I'll settle up the debt. His possessions, he set him on a donkey. He bound him with his own bandage. He anointed his wounds with the same oil that he kept for his first aid kit. And this man, would more likely was a Jew, who would probably wouldn't give him the time of day But he came, bound him up, set him on the donkey, took him to the hotel, probably to his own room. He knew the host because the host agreed to it and said, hey, take care of him, pay the medical people, pay the doctors, whatever you need. This should cover it. You realize that two pence back then was a lot of money. He gave him a pretty good chunk. He said, that doesn't cover it you know I'm good for it. When you look at the Bible, God gives us so many examples. I learned from a good friend of mine who was very wealthy. He says, Gordon, remember, either you have money or the money has you. I know a lot of people that the money has them. They're not nice to be around most of the time. And I know people that have money but it doesn't have them. They're some of the kindest and most generous people. And they don't think about it. They don't rub it in your face. Well, I've got this and I've got that. And I know people that don't have much that would give you the shirt off their back at the drop of a hat. God doesn't care what we have. Remember, God wants us to be a conduit, a vessel. God may give through you what he not, may not necessarily give to you. That's what God's done in my life a lot of times. He just channeled me. And I like that. That's okay. Because my home in heaven is going to be like your home in heaven. It's going to be beautiful. This is all temporal. This is my travel trailer. Amen. It's going to fall apart one day. But my home is in heaven. That's permanent. It's where moth and rust and thieves will never be. Exodus 35 verse 5, Take ye among you an offering unto the Lord. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring an offering of the Lord gold, silver, and brass. Guess what it goes back to, folks? A willing heart. If God has got our heart through salvation, God will get our life. God will get our family and God will get everything we own because you know why? It's not ours anyway. He's just blessed us with it. 2 Corinthians 8, in closing, turn with me there, 2 Corinthians 8. Verse 1, we just covered a little bit of the story on how the Macedonian church was started Wednesday night. And in verse 1 it says, Moreover, brethren, we do you wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift 
and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Here's a church in deep poverty, deep affliction, tribulation. They were being persecuted. Many Christians in that time had to be branded with a C on their right or the left hand. And if that C was found, they were not allowed to buy, they were not allowed to sell, they were to be ostracized. Everything was stripped from them. Guess what? That was the first church. God took care of them. They found out about the poverty in Jerusalem, the starvation going on, and the church of Corinth, one year had gone by and they had not given what they'd laid aside. They were wealthy. And so Paul wrote to their shame. He says, I want to tell you about the grace of God that was bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia and they were so poor they couldn't rub two pennies together. Yet they beseeched Paul. They begged him when he says, I, I can't take it. No, you're going to take it. Don't rob us of our blessing. But you don't have any. We have all we need. Amen? What more do we need when we have Christ? When God says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. All things. Do you think God's going to let you starve? Do you think God's going to break His promise? I have never had God break run promise with me. He may and He will religiously keep me to the last minute. Why? He tests my faith. Because I have a tendency to forget what He did yesterday to me. And I will see, like, Lord, one of the greatest choir songs that my wife and I used to sing at Crossroads was Here Comes Jesus Right on Time. Lazarus was dead three days. Why? So he can prove he was the way, the truth, and life. He was the resurrection and the life. That he has victory over death. There are times when he waits to test our faith. He waited with Saul. Saul failed. All he asked was to wait on Samuel. And he didn't. Christians God tests our faith. He wants to know if we're going to be faithful to Him to the end. He's not going to leave us nor forsake us. He's there. He gave us the greatest gift we could ever have, eternal life. But it's out there. It's left unopened in a lot of people's lives. You've heard the gift. You've seen the gift but you haven't accepted it yourself. This morning, the greatest thing I can ask you, have you given your heart to Jesus this Christmas? If Christ has got your heart, then why hasn't He got our lives, our families, and our possessions? Maybe He has, and that's a blessing. Make sure nothing steals it. Can we do more? Oh yeah. A lot of times my bar on that high vault it's just down here. See, I can pull vault. God sometimes wants to lift it a little higher because He knows what we can really do through Him. I can do some things through Christ with strength in me. Is that how the Bible verse reads? I can do all things through Christ. We limit what we can do. Don't listen to the devil. God has a great plan for you this Christmas. But He can't do nothing when you haven't given his heart. Give him your heart. Give him your life. Give him your precious family. It's not ours anyway. God says our families are blessings to him. And give him our possessions. It's his anyway. God gives us everything we need. If we hold it back, that conduit will be stopped up. I know I've been there. A lot of times we just, thank you, Lord. Appreciate that. Yep. 
and we become Scrooge. Don't be Scrooge. Not this Christmas. Not ever. Because Christ has always been the greatest giver of all. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, as we contemplate the message preached and the thoughts presented, may we reflect in our heart, first of all, if we know Jesus Christ is our personal Savior. If we not only know Him, but if we actually bowed our heads and followed the Scripture and confess with our mouth and repented of our sins. As the Bible says in Luke chapter 13, except we repent, we will likewise perish. And in verse 6, he says again, except you repent, you will likewise perish. Repenting is turning from, change of mind. May we know for sure that our salvation is based on God's Word. Not on somebody else's Word or experience or hearsay or faithfulness to church, but based on Jesus Christ and the atoning blood. Lord, thank you for our families, our life and health, our possessions. You've been blessing us all these years with so many blessings. May we return that to you this Christmas. Say here, Lord. Here's my life. Here's my family. And here's my possessions. Help me to be wise. And be faithful giving back to you. Lord, dismiss with your blessing. Lord, if there's someone's here that's lost and undone, let this be the morning that they come and say, I need to know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Thank you for your blessings of reminding us, encouraging us one more time. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. May the Lord bless you. Looking forward to seeing each and every one of you tonight at 5 o'clock. And uh, don't forget, if you do not know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, I'd love to take the Word of God and show you how you can know. And those online, feel free to give me a call. We'd love to be able to show you how to give Christ the greatest gift you can ever give this Christmas. Lord bless. We'll see you tonight. Have a great afternoon.